Ja, ich bin ja Sorry you're standing there at the back. Would you like to sit down along the passages? Please be comfortable. In the Vandukarilla? I think IIT 
entrance exam is passed only by the cream of Indian students. So congratulations for getting this far. I am very aware of how hard you must have worked or how intelligent all of you are. My father was a professor with IIT Kharagpur. He was a naval officer and um, I think the Navy sent him on deputation to IIT Kharagpur to teach the naval architecture course. <laughs> ship building, ship design and building. And uh, that's where I was born. I was born in Bengal. I have an Irish mother and Bengali father. <laughs> but I always say I'm the South Indian Bengali because my Tamil is better than Bengali. <laughs> But interestingly, the name Amala in Bengali is actually Omola. So when the young man who was introducing me was saying Amala, <laughs> it's okay because anyway Amala is a kind of a universal, um, all India, all India name. So yeah, Omola, Amala, Amala, anything will do. <laughs> Um, so I was told that if I bring in the film angle, it might be more interesting for you. Um, so let me give you a little bit of my background and my journey through films, just to spice it up a little. Um, so dad was in the Navy and he would move every six years, seven years, they'd be posted in different places. And uh, he was posted in Vishakhapatnam after Kharagpur, where he worked uh, in the naval dockyard, the naval dockyard, and then went on to R&D, um, NSTL it's called. Who's heard of it? Vishakhapatnam, NSTL, there you go. Yeah. So there the research and technology goes on and he was there for about 14 years, during which time I moved to Chennai. And I moved to Chennai because uh, I joined Kalakshitra. You've heard of Kalakshitra? Tirman Muir. Yeah. So I grew up there. And for the first time I was exposed to vegetarian culture. <laughs> Because up until then, you know, the Bengalis and the Irish big meat eaters, um, it was a big surprise. And as an eight or nine year old, I was saying, oh my goodness, you can actually live without eating animals. <laughs> it was a big eye opener for me and it was wonderful. I experimented with vegetarianism and I found it really suited me because I was totally animal crazy. I mean, every street dog and street cat and you name it were my friends. And I had names for them all. I think I rescued my first um, injured creature, which was a crow. I think I, I rescued the crow when I was six years old. And lucky for me, my mom never said, dirty, don't bring it in. She, she never said stuff like that. She always gave me a little corner somewhere in the storeroom or in my bedroom and helped me clean up the little creature and get it back on its feet. And I remember calling, it was the time, the year Enter the Dragon had released, so I called the crow Bruce Lee. <laughs> but Bruce Lee didn't make it. He also died quite young. Um, yeah, so Kalakshitra was uh, wonderful. It was, uh, I spent 10 years there. I became a vegetarian there. And I became a hardcore animal activist. And I wouldn't let any of the boys in school kill the snakes. And I 
certainly wouldn't let anyone harm the stray dogs. And any time one of them would chew up somebody's slipper, because we had to leave our slippers outside the classroom. You know, it's the kind of very traditional cottages to go in without the slippers. And the dogs would promptly go up and chew somebody's slippers. So they would scream across the campus, Amala, your dog! <laughs> so I was quite notorious. Um, I interacted with Rukmini Devi Arunde. I don't know if any of you have heard about her. Uh, she was the lady who started um, Talak Shetra. She was also a very fine dancer. And uh, she was responsible for uh, a renaissance of Indian arts and culture at that time and made it very respectable and acceptable to practice uh, dance or music. Um, she was also the person who presented a report on cruelty to animals in parliament. She was an MP and uh, she presented this report when Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was Prime Minister and it was 1958 at the time and everyone was so moved. It was a time before Parliament threw tables and chairs at each other and shouted and screamed and had to be adjourned because of bad behaviour. It was long before all those days so they actually sat through her report and they were so deeply moved. Um, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act was passed in 1960 based on that report and that is the, is the very core of the animal welfare movement in India. So this is a lady whom I would listen to an assembly every day during college um, whose views and whose visions you know, deeply influenced my thoughts and inspired me to look at the world differently. Mm. And um, when I was about 13, I, start, I was uh, picked up from the students to be part of the troupe, the Kalakshitra dance troupe. It was a famous troupe, we traveled all over the world. And then there was constant clash between my dance director and my principal who would argue about she's missing class and my dance director would say what better way to study than the, the university of life and uh, well that's how school and college got over but in my final year I realized that um, being a member of a troupe is very nice, it's wonderful, you see the world you have a great team with you, you're constantly performing uh, it's uh, very exciting and you know, you're learning new things, you're traveling to new cities, new places, new cultures, but it doesn't quite pay the bills, at least it didn't in those days. And by then my parents had, had, had been divorced a long time and I certainly had to pay my own bills. So. Um, it so happened that in my final year, the film directors used to come after the show, after the performance and say, would you like to act? We have a very good role, would you like to act? And uh, initially I never paid any attention because I wasn't a big film buff. Um, but suddenly when I realized I had to pay the bills, I said, okay, let me try this. The only other option would be a dancer is you teach, but at uh, 18, 19, you don't want to teach, right? You want to, you want to perform, you want to see the world. So, so I gave it a shot. It was a director called um, T. Dajinder. The first film he offered me a role. He offered me a role uh, as a classical dancer. It was a completely new experience for me. Um, during the shoot, I mean, I was learning all the time. And that film became a very big hit. So, the day after that film became a hit, I was back to my normal life on my TVS 50. 
at the traffic light thinking, okay, I'm going to go for my next rehearsal. And suddenly, I could hear voices at the traffic light. Amlada, Parada! sign my second film to buy a car and that's literally why I signed my second film because I realized I needed a car <laughs> but there was no looking back and it was fabulous it was uh, so empowering it was great work I got to work with all the greats I got to learn I got to stand on my own two feet I was famous I was successful um, I earned a lot of money and then um, at some point I met Nagarjuna and uh, he asked me to marry him. Also, a time for me where I had a burnout. You know, when you start, when you're a young starter, you know, I started at 13. Um, I'm sure all of you have experienced a moment where you've burnt the midnight oil preparing for exams and you're just so exhausted you can't imagine getting through another day of it. And that's literally the state I was in. Um, along with success, I think comes a huge demand on your time. I had worked uh, seven years, almost 365 days a year, um, 50 films, and in five different languages. I was learning new languages as well. And I was totally burnt out. So I decided to take a break. And lucky for me, I had a husband who didn't expect me to go to work the next morning. So he was fine with it. And I moved to Hyderabad with this huge hope that I was going to have a new life. I was going to find something different to do. I was going to take a break from the films. So uh, I know a lot of people go through burnout. You can't pace yourself and I think when you start that young, you don't have the mental maturity also to pace yourself. Looking back now, I might have done it differently, but um, I think it was perfect at the time. That I quit films and I had the time to notice when I moved to Hyderabad that there were sick and injured animals lying everywhere. And the Amla from school woke up again, jumped out of her car and started rescuing all these animals. And within a month of moving to Hyderabad, my house was like a zoo. <laughs> I had injured animals in every nook and corner. It was my house, right? And I had a buffalo with a broken hip in the garage. And Nan came back from shooting one evening and said, Hmm. I think you need to get organized and it was his idea that we start Blue Cross of Hyderabad, that we start a proper organization with the rescue service. <laughs> and he donated me my first ambulance. In those days, movie stars had to take their own vehicle. They didn't have the big caravans provided for them like they do now. So he had this outdoor tempo traveler and uh, he gifted that to me and said, here, here's your ambulance. So I stripped it down much to everybody's horror. They thought I was mad. And uh, I had a painted white, big blue ambulance written on it. And I shifted my home phone to the local veterinary hospital, which was run by the government. And um, I used every opportunity to talk about animal rescue and the number to call. So 
road accidents, disease, abandoned animals that were suffering on the road, unable to help themselves, with nobody to care. People started calling in. And today, 20, it's been 21 years today. Yeah. January, we completed 21 years. We receive almost 200 calls a day now, and we rescue at least 25 animals a day. Our shelter is houses about 800 sick, injured, abused, abandoned animals. We have 400 volunteers working with us, about 30 staff, including three vets. And uh, I meet young people wherever I go, all wanting to learn, wanting to have answers. And it is simply wonderful. It hasn't been easy work. It's very hard work. But it's simply been wonderful. And that is my story. Um, so, what is it that you would like to hear from me? Um, does climate change and the effects of climate change uh, interest you? Uh, would you like to know a little bit more about films? Would you like to know a little bit more about animals? Or are you willing to go along with me? Whatever I've prepared for you. I'm, I'm good. I, I can do whatever works. Yeah? More about animals? Okay. Somebody else said whatever I like. Okay. Anyone in the back? You sure you're okay standing? Alright, let me take you through a little bit of what I've prepared. You know, I've had a talk at IIT Hyderabad last week. And they particularly asked me to talk about climate change simply because they said a lot of their projects had to do with disaster management and um, climate risk. Do you have any of that in your course? No. No. All right. But it, it is an important issue. And so I'll run you through a few of the slides. Um, I'm an eternal student. I, I love to constantly learn and improve and grow in my understanding about the world and other creatures that live here. And in this quest, I attended a training program with Mr. Al Gore. How many of you have seen um, An Inconvenient Truth? Some of you have, yeah. It's all about the climate change issue. And of course, now there's enough science out there for, every, for it to be common knowledge. So, in the climate change perspective, there is a, there is a huge need to pay heed to what we're doing to our planet. And working with the environment, working with animals, we constantly come into a wall of this damage humanity is doing, human, the human world is doing to the planet. And therefore I think it's quite appropriate to start with climate change. Then we'll see a little bit more about animals. So, when you look at a picture of the planet, you see how fragile it is. That it isn't this infinite mammoth body, celestial body which you can go on plundering and go on destroying and not expect some drastic results. So looking, just looking at it, you see how fragile the planet is. And into this planet on a daily basis, um, the amount of greenhouse gases being pumped into the atmosphere has led to what we are now looking at, climate change. And climate change is 
something that's affecting life on earth, that's changing life on earth. And it's not just getting hotter, but it's about huge and permanent changes. So let's just look at what are those changes. So if you look at this graph, you have the blue line and then you have the white line. And the blue line shows the carbon dioxide concentrations. And the bottom line of the graph goes back 600,000 years. Yeah? 600,000 years. So you see the peaks and the dips and the peaks and the dips. And that would probably cover 100,000 years each peak and dip. So probably ice ages when the dip comes. And then you see the temperature graph below. And if you were to put them together, do you see any similarity? And that's what the climate change science is, right? As the carbon dioxide increases, the temperature increases, right? So, that's 600,000 years of history. And this came from studying ice cylinders dug out from the Arctic. Yeah, they use special machines to bring out ice and they studied the, in each layer of ice they had water molecules and air molecules captured in it, captured in it, which then gave them these readings and they could go back 600,000 years. <coughs> now that's the history, it's history, it's science. If you look at the carbon dioxide readings of today, that's where it is. And about 45 years ahead in this continuing trajectory that we are following, that's where it's going to be. And that's what's alarming in the climate change science, right? That as the carbon dioxide increases, the temperature is going to increase, and can we bear that shift? So compared to 600,000 years, this is a disturbing truth. If you look at the carbon emissions per person in the world, India is pretty low. It's way down. But multiplied into our population, it makes up for everything else. And then just as um, the 19... 20-year-old Amla on the TVS 50 went out aspiring to buy a car. I'm sure every Indian wants, who's riding a two-wheeler is aspiring to get a car. So uh, uh, we shouldn't get comfortable in the fact that we are low in our carbon footprint. So what does the raise and rise in temperature means. It means it's going to affect the water cycle all over the planet. Okay? So there's going to be a lot of glacier melting. There's going to be huge amounts of moisture into the atmosphere through evaporation. It means desertification in a lot of places. It means torrential rainfall in other places. The, the new technology for reading uh, Weather predictions due to climate change tell us the satellite readings say that there are rivers in the atmosphere just waiting, rivers of moisture in the atmosphere just waiting to come down as rainfall because of this high temperature, you know, so much moisture being evaporated. And where these rivers of moisture are going to come down, nobody can predict because it hasn't happened before. And that's why you have torrential rainfall in Mumbai, or you have torrential rainfall in a place where, you know, and the entire year's precipitation comes in like two days. And this is what uh, the climate change catastrophes are about. If you look at India, you have the Himalayas, which is the source of water. Uh, the Himalayan glaciers are the source of water for India. And you'll see 
anywhere up north of uh, Madhya Pradesh, all the rivers are fed by the Himalayan glaciers. They all originate in the Himalayan glaciers. And so with the melting of Himalayas, over time, it means there will be tremendous flooding along these rivers, followed by permanent drought. Right? So these rivers will dry up. If Himalayas melts, that means there won't be any water in the north. Um, and coming to the south, we have rain-fed rivers. And if the rain patterns change, then these rivers will also be very unpredictable as water source. Um, the earth's cooling system is in danger. As hot air rises, we all know hot air rises above the equator and it creates a kind of a vacuum for cool air to pass in and then this air moves to the um, <coughs> poles, the two poles, where around the ice peaks and ice caps it cools down and goes, sinks and then travels back to the equator and this gives it the Earth's natural cooling system. And the same thing with the sea currents. Hot, air, hot water rises up along the equator, rushes to the poles, it cools, it sinks, it comes back. You have the whole Earth's natural cooling system functioning. When the poles, when the ice caps melt, we're going to be lacking a cooling system. And then one degree increase in the equator with nothing to cool it down means a huge increase in temperature and unpredicted what Earth's temperatures will be. There's a law that you can't work when it hits 50 degrees. So we have some, I mean we're already 45 degrees in Hyderabad every summer and we didn't have winter this year. Hyderabad has a winter every year, this year we didn't have winter. Um, so you can say that okay this is something that happens, it's natural, there are natural causes, it's happened before, it's going to happen. This is, you know, the earth goes through this and it's true, the earth does go through this. But what does it mean to us? It means a lot of deaths in the summer, huge amounts of loss of life as well as property due to unpredicted rainfall, um, changes in crop patterns because uh, desertification, you know, our staple diet is paddy, so we'll have to shift to other um, crops that are grow in arid climates. This is what is happening to most of the paddy fields. And uh, new diseases, new vectors of disease because they can survive in warmer climate. Um, the maps of the world will be redrawn. In AP alone, if the, the ice caps melt at the rate that they're melting now, they're expecting 5 meters raised in the next 50 years. Five meters raised means six million people homeless. And so along with the natural disasters come a lot of um, climate refugees. Is it happening? Yes, it is. The uh, glaciers are melting. So what's making it happen um, which is different to what's happened before? The fact is that it's a collision of many different factors. You've got, uh, never before have we been so many of us on the planet. So that's one critical factor. And then, never before have we had such advanced science and technology. So, um, what would mean, um, say the cycle of a carbon molecule in the past would have been um, one million years or two million years. And today it's like, it could be one year, simply because we're drilling, we have equipment to drill into fossil fuels that have never been tapped for millions of years. And we drill and we empty out the, the oil well and then we ship it to a city where it's then burnt up by a car. 
So you see, in one year, what was taking a few million years before, it's happening much faster. And this is what's propelling this climate change unlike anything else before. Um, let's look at the population explosion. So I'm not just here to, to tell you the dangers, right? We're here to look at what are the solutions. And um, I have sons who are probably your age. And my concern as a mom is always what, what world are we leaving our sons and daughters behind? And my first instinct is always an apology that we didn't know enough and we didn't do enough. And we're sorry that you're inheriting all these um, problems. And the world that I grew up in was very, very different to the world you have today. Um, but there are things that we are doing to solve the, the problem and there are things that we can share with you that if you do too, that we can adapt. So one of the main factors is of course the population growth, right? And the only way population growth can be controlled are through these female education. The fact that every girl child deserves an education, deserves her um, empowerment, where she stands up and has her own financial capacity. That, wherever a country has been able to achieve 100% of that, the population growth has not only really stabilized, but has also declined. Which goes to prove that no woman wants to be a baby making machine. And sadly, in India today, it's only the last couple of years that the right to education has come. So any of you volunteering with an NGO working for the girl child, congratulations. If you haven't yet considered, I request you to consider. And let's get 100% girl child education in our country. And another is, of course, healthcare that while many, many women have several babies simply because they're not sure which one is going to survive. Can you imagine a mother not sure which of her babies will survive because she doesn't have access to healthcare. So healthcare is another area where India really needs to provide, to prevent um, the population growth. <coughs> If we look at political will, which is another very important factor of climate change mitigation, this is uh, a slide of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. We know what Haiti went through, no? Terrible, terrible uh, disaster, natural disasters. And that's the political will. You can clearly see on one side they have strong environmental laws and on the other they don't. And who was victim? The environmental laws simply protected the land from those kind of catastrophes. But the sad thing is the planet is so fragile that even if you are the neighbor, you will suffer, right? It's going to affect everyone. Um, I don't know why this is not showing, but in Northern Africa, between Darfur and Niger, a lake dried up. The slide was actually, it had the picture of the lake. Lake Chad dried up. And because of the lack of water in that desert region, five million people died of genocide. In a place where the natural resources are finished, are get over, of course there will be civil war and genocide and all kinds of terrible catastrophes and nobody can do anything about it. So brothers fought brothers for water and five million people died in that war. But the good news is every single issue can be solved 
and we have the technology. And one of the simple ways to mitigate is to protect our forests. We know that. And that's what all the COP discussions are about. Protect the forest, regrow old forest, protect the forest, protect the forest, cut down your carbon emissions. But we're still arguing. So at every COP discussions, the West, who's already learned the hard way, they're saying, who oh, suffering the big storms and the big hurricanes, you know, the hurricanes are getting bigger and, and stronger each time. And the, the discussions at COP are always, no, you cut back and they say, no, you, this, you know, you had your chance to destroy the planet, now we must have our chance to destroy the planet. And that's pretty much how far they've gotten. So developing countries are saying, we got to do it, we got to give up that carbon, we're not cutting back, and the West is saying, no, no, please cut back, we'll pay you to cut back. And it's, it's just one big <coughs> debate over there, and they haven't come to any conclusions. And in the bargain, this is the state of Indian forests. And this is the state of Indian wildlife. And we've got just about a thousand or eleven hundred tigers left. Tigers being the cornerstone of our forest. That so many hundreds of species depend on them. The forest itself depends on the tiger for protection. You won't have a protection force in the forest unless there's a tiger. If there's no tiger, God help the rest of the animals. Because the government only provides protection if there's a tiger around there. And despite that, who are protecting on poor battalion of uh, forest guards who don't have shoes, they don't have uniforms, they haven't been paid for six months. Mudumale tribal guards, so they haven't been paid for six months last time I saw them. How do they get to their check post? They have to walk 16 kilometers, no vehicle. Who are they up, up against? They are up against um, uh, night vision equipment and uh, four-wheel drive, commando-like uh, poachers. So that's the state of things. <coughs> So, finally, we're looking at the way we think. Now, you set out when you're young, you want to change the world, you have great visions, this is how it should be. And then you come front to front with reality. And it can be very frustrating, it can be very disappointing, it can be very, make you very angry. I remember I was such an angry young woman. I was angry because the world didn't, wasn't like the way all my teachers and my professors and my, all the grown-ups had promised me the world is like this. And then when I realized, oh my God, it's not like that, I was angry. I was angry with myself, I was angry with the world. And then, of course, I learned to channel that into social work and I learned to channel to work for a cause instead of just being angry all the time. And um, to change the way people think, um, it's not easy, yeah? And any kind of social change starts with um, the training to do that is a two-year MS social, social work course, which is taught uh, MSc social work, yeah? The training is basically how do you change a mindset, how do you get a community to look at things differently, how do you... But interestingly, that change, as Gandhiji said, begins with me, right? So, first of all, you need to change. You need to do it differently. You need to think differently. You need to be willing to go out there and do it differently before you can inspire anyone else to do it. And just to um, 
so we're in this planet, we're cooking ourselves, we're, we're doing it. And we say, no, they should reduce the carbon emissions, they should reduce the carbon emissions. You do, you do, you do, you do, you do. So just to illustrate what um, social change or uh, evolution, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here with a little story about an experiment. You'll find this very interesting. So there was this um, study being done of the islands of Japan. Okay, the scientists were observing a species of monkey, uh, the Makaka fiscata. And they were noting down everything they could and taking, you know, test samples. And there was something about the connection between the Homo sapien and this species of monkey. They were looking for the missing link. And in the bargain, the one scientist, you know, the islands of Japan are spread around 200, they each are separated by ocean, maybe 200 kilometers also of ocean. So, you know, spread out. And one particular um, scientist taught uh, a young female monkey, about eight months old. They used to pick up uh, tubers, dig up tubers from the ground for their food and collect fruit from the trees and some leaves and some shoots. And uh, the tubers were always caked with dirt. So he taught this little female monkey to go and wash the tuber in a nearby stream. And she was smart. Immediately she realized, okay, the dirt is gone, it tastes good. So she started carrying her food to the stream every day wash and eat and of course monkeys are curious so all her peers and all her friends started watching what is she doing and they also experimented and they also enjoyed the new taste to the food and uh, this went on for some time and I think uh, after a few months or a year or I'm not sure how long exactly uh, the scientist started recording that the Malfusca Mustata on this island were all washing the food before they ate. But it wasn't just that. Simultaneously, they started getting wireless telecommunication from all over. Wherever this experiment was being conducted on all the islands around Japan, they were calling in saying today the, Mafus the Makaka Fuscata Wherever it is seen, it is washing the food before it's eating. This was called the hundred monkey. Um, and I know you have monkey problems here, we'll get to that. <laughs> but the... <coughs> the... The interesting thing was, they recorded that when enough members of the species begins to behave in a certain manner and their numbers reach the critical mass for that species, then the change happens. So when I said we, the change begins with you, it means enough of us have to start experimenting with a new way to treat our Earth, to treat our fellow creatures, and it's only when our numbers reach the critical mass that the change will happen. It's not going to happen with laws. It's not going to happen with fights and battles and wars. It's going to happen with each individual waking up. So, um, I'm going to wrap it up really soon. The fresh water in the world is limited. We have all the technology we need, but are we going to use it, is the question. Um, in the process, every kind of recycling or cleaning up environmental effort you do will help. Green technology will help. And finally, if you look at the animals that are contributing to our lives, um, we have over 6.7 billion animals raised for food every year. Uh, we spoke about the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. That act 
uh, forms the Animal Welfare Board, which then advises state governments and which also helps increase social understanding for that hundred monkey shift. Um, we've got a lot of laws that protect animals and the laws are very thorough, they're very well thought of, they were written with the best of intentions, but the sad part is there's no implementation and there's no social responsibility and somehow we've reached a place in India where if there's a law we've got to learn how to break it or go under it or go over it or go around it. We're not very law abiding. We feel that if there's a rule or a law, it's really meant to be broken. I don't know if that's the case with IIT students, but that's the case with most students. Um, and the truth is the animals are in the bargain. Uh, because laws are meant to protect all that's sacred, all that's important, all that's um, of value for a country. And the animals that are used for human consumption, they suffer a lot. They suffer not just in the farms, but they suffer in our homes, in our zoos, you name it. So you may ask, why bother about animals? Um, human, human health has driven us. And we've seen with mad cow disease and SARS and avian flu, that as when you have so many animals put together, and uh, the minimum standards of welfare, the minimum uh, requirements met, infectious diseases spread. And these diseases become pandemics. And with mad cow disease, the entire cattle population of England and Europe was wiped out. Uh, millions of cattle had to be put down. With avian flu and SARS also, avian flu wiped out the poultry industry in India completely and it had to be restarted. And so the economic uh, damage is colossal as well as the human health aspect suffers greatly. Um, there are even pharmaceuticals that are used in animal production which without control, without welfare measures, uh, they get into the food chain, right? Antibiotics, animals are pumped with ant antibiotics. And then of course all this um, outflow goes into the ground and then pollutes the groundwater for the for the human community and uh, i can't i will not stop i can go on for the next hour telling you what damage is being done and these are serious concerns and that's why government of india has brought in compulsory I mean, the, the whole, whole world has compulsory animal welfare measures but now even government of india is looking at very stringent animal welfare measures so, because animals are sentient beings, they deserve freedom from cruelty. And the constitution, Indian laws assure that and uh, demand that. And every law is so beautifully written that every act of cruelty is punishable. But because the animal can't speak, it goes unchecked. And because the fines were written in 1960, they seem very small now. So, they'll throw the money at your face and go away. But um, they're looking at revising the laws. If parliament goes through one day without fighting and throwing chairs and tables at each other, you know, at least the women protection laws will be passed and then maybe the animal protection laws will follow. But uh, somewhere we hope the hundred monkey will happen. Um, so the law is very good and we've got lots of laws. Um, I've already told you about the Blue Cross. Um, uh, have I told you about how wonderful the Indian dog is? Do you want to hear that or should we move to questions? Maybe we can come back to this. Um, sure, I'd be happy to take some questions. Working. 
<laughs> there is a particular slide you showed between uh, CO2 and temperature levels. The noticeable thing in the graph for me was that after there is a peak, the temperature started to fall. So how are we going to be sure that it will not continue to rise or whether it comes down? I mean. Good question. Very good question. And um, you know, Mr. Al Gore explains this much better than I can. But uh, I would request you go back to the Inconvenient Truth or even read his book next. Uh, there's a book, a sequel to the Inconvenient Truth. Um, what I understand is um, when the cooling system stops, right, and the temperatures raise so alarmingly with no res no respite. That means it will be an alarming raise in temperature and it will be continuous, right? There's something about the axis shift uh, which starts an ice age. Now how that happens, I'm not an IIT student to explain. But that's how they say the, the ice age has happened, you know? The mammoth, a big mammoth was standing there in this grassland eating grasses and suddenly the earth froze and millions of years later when they dug up in Siberia and found the mammoth in the ice they found undigested grasses in the stomach which means the freezing happened pretty much instantaneously it didn't give the food time to rot or to decay it didn't even give the stomach time to digest the food. So these are very alarming things and we don't know enough to predict. And the thing about climate change is it's not predictable because we don't have the, the measures or the, the equipment to predict it. So the, the only understanding is when the temperatures peak, there will be a drop, but that means there will be a severe drop. Uh, and these kind of changes, living beings are not equipped to handle. So, they, do, they call climate scientists doomsday predictors, and that's why we don't go there. We don't want to be doomsday predictors, but that's what the, the, the information is showing. Um, like I said, I don't explain it well enough, so my suggestion is just look, read um, Al Gore's work and you find, or Dr. Pachori's work and you find the answers. Uh, may I ask a question? Please. Uh, what do you say about non-vegetarian food? Ah, uh, good question. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. Um, I'll just continue with a few of the slides because that was what was next on the presentation where I could see a lot of you squirming uh, with all this serious stuff coming at you and so I wanted to just let you relax a bit. The factory farming of animals for food. Um, in the past there were grasslands where the animals were grazed or backyard farming or you know community raised their animals and that was sufficient. But things have changed. Because of the large population and the huge amounts of food required, it's switched to factory farming. And factory farming means large numbers of animals, cramped spaces, feed, 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 stall feeding, uh, huge amounts of uh, antibiotics because uh, there's so much disease rampant and it spreads so fast. Pump them up with hormones because you've got to deliver the goods quickly. You've got to grow fast. And um, so this is pretty much how farming is done, yeah? Whether it's the eggs you eat or the meat you eat or the fish you eat, it's all, that's how it's raised. And um, while the COP discussions are about protecting the far forests, forests are being deforested um, to grow soy and corn to feed animals in factory farms. So more and more forests are being cleared and more and more farmers are switching from paddy and beets and vegetables to growing corn and soy which is far more um, uh, 
lucrative to feed factory farmed animals. And these animals contribute to 18% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than all the carbon emissions in the world. All the trans road transport put together comes only to 14%. So greenhouse gas emissions from animals is 18%. And this is methane. Methane, as you all know, is 300 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. Yeah? So the methods of all these farms are terribly cruel because of the high level of stress and irritation. They're extremely cruel. They remove their body parts like the beak, the claws, the teeth from animals in factory farms. Um, they are only commodities. They're just bread or milk or grown and then used as meat making machines including dairy cattle. Every dairy cow is sold at the age of 5. Her lifespan is 12. She sold at 5 because her milk production drops and she's too big to feed. It's not economically viable. The pollution from them is huge. The calves are sold as meal. Uh, they're trucked off in very cruel circumstances. They're killed, you know, extremely cruel. If you look at a Kerala video now that's gone viral on YouTube, you'll see how they slaughter them in the slaughterhouse. Um, there's so much we can do. But definitely the one thing we can do is reduce our carbon footprint. Now, the animal rights movement is based on a lot of thinkers and visionaries who see long-term solutions, who look at the hundred monkey. What are, we, what are we creating for the future? If these are the practices and these are the cruelties and these are the damages we're causing, maybe we should start practicing something different. And there's lots of literature out, of there, out there if you want to read, because I'm not going to take today about philosophizing on why. So go out there and pick up uh, a book and, and explore what these thinkers are seeing. This is one amazing book. So the word humane, and this is where I'll answer the question that was asked. The word humane may be new to you. If it's not, you already are aware. It's, um, humane means doing it the way that's better for the animal. Better for the human, better for the animal. So, in the picture you see the hen with her chicks. Now, this is humane farming. It's backyard farming. The, the, she has a, a natural uh, life. She has uh, fresh air. She has, you know, she's not trapped in a little cage which she has to share with ten others for all her life. Uh, this is humane. And they say that this will solve world hunger problems and it will solve world health problems because along with along with the global increase in dairy production in meat production you know rapidly uh, 10 years ago it was 1.6 billion now it's like 7 6.7 billion yeah so with the rapid growth of all these foods there's also been witnessed a rapid increase in health problems like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, you name it. And even in India, there's a 20% growth in childhood obesity, which we never saw before. Of course, the poor kids don't have playgrounds. You're very fortunate to have lovely grounds here to go play uh, cricket and stuff on your time off. But many of the kids don't have places to go play. And so, looking at all of it, there are solutions, and the first is, of course, to reduce your carbon footprint big time. Long story short, a vegetarian diet is definitely healthier for you, healthier for the planet, and certainly healthier for the animals. Any other questions? I promise I won't make such long answers. No? Yes. Hi. Um, we know you're a complete vegan. I just 
curious, in your day-to-day -day life as an environmentalist, what are the little things that you incorporate towards the environment? Um, very good question. Um, it starts, you can start with, uh, I start with my kitchen. I have a kamba in my kitchen. You've heard of a kamba? Who's heard of a kamba? No? Okay, it's a, it's a little contraption, again, made by a, she's from NIT, Ahmedabad. She's created, she designed this little contraption, which are three earthen pots that stand on top of each other with little ventilation holes. And you put your kitchen waste in it, and basically you compost. And you can compost in your small balcony outside your kitchen. So my kitchen is zero kitchen waste. Uh, we recycle everything. Um, my garden is also all the leaves. Everything is composted. We have uh, composting baskets outside for the garden. So nothing is burnt. Everything is composted. Uh, because I, we have every three to four weeks, we have huge quantities of very rich compost. Uh, the trees thrive. Uh, we've got fruiting trees, flowering trees, and birds are, it's crazy with birds, there's birds everywhere. Um, uh, it's like a little wildlife sanctuary and in the house. Uh, um, we've got all the street dogs sterilized and vaccinated, so um, we don't have puppies, we don't have disease on the street. I have a 11... Indian dogs that I look after, and two cats. Um, I walk wherever I can, although I like the Pied Piper, I have several people following me. Um, I also take every opportunity when those people follow me to talk about composting, to talk about Indian dogs, and uh, a lot of people avoid me because of that. <laughs> But I take every opportunity to discuss this in the community I live. Uh, I take every opportunity as a celebrity, wherever I'm invited, to say, you know, there's a better way to do things. Because I'm sincerely uh, one of those hundred monkeys, which I think the, the, the buck stops here. Um, we need to do our bit first, and we need to be examples if we want that change to happen. Um, I also, uh, I have my, I have a full wall on certificates from the, the, the e-waste recycling people that I'm a conscientious citizen from my used batteries to my, all my e-waste. I give them a call once in six months and they send the vehicle to take away all the e-waste and we don't throw it into the garbage. Yeah, so have I been able to influence? I don't know. I'm talking today. Do any of you feel inspired? You do? No? I see someone speaking there. <laughs> okay, I want a, a, a show of hands. I'm not going to shoot you, don't worry. How many of you inspired today? I am on them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I'm Prakriti. I have a question for you. Uh, that is, when you set out for such a great cause, I'm sure you would have faced some sort of a resource crunch and all that. People, when, when, according to what I believe, when they set out to start an NGO or any social cause, the, the response from public or the financial res, uh, response or any sort of resources that we need, it might not be readily available. Did you face, uh, what are the problems that you faced 20 years ago about and how did you overcome it? Good question. Much easier for me because.
because I had been an actress and that I had already satisfied all my financial needs before I started doing all this. And I, I do believe that, that a, a, a human being must do that first. And satisfying your own financial needs, your family responsibilities, uh, your own aspirations are very, very important. And perhaps I couldn't have done all this hadn't I reached that point. But it doesn't stop you from being a volunteer, right? And the truth is, to give or to do, you don't need a big bank balance. You need the heart. Um, I have seen uh, mothers bring their kids. A little boy came with his mother one day. I was working at my shelter. She comes with the kid. Um, he's not wearing chappals. They've changed three buses to come. And um, she gives me this little packet of money, thousand rupees, that the kid wanted to donate for the animals on his birthday. A crore of rupees somebody giving because it's the capacity you have that you give and I think that's the, the seed every mom and I, I saluted that mother what a wonderful mother she must be to have inculcated that, that thought in her son so yes um, one year into animal welfare I was totally broke I had spent everything I had uh, in my bank account and till date my bank account is usually zero and the joke is always uh, she gets any money the first thing the checks will go out to different organizations. I support some 16 different organizations the, and they vary not just animals. I, mean, I feel money comes only really to be given. I have a blessed life. I I just want to take care of me. <laughs> but the, the truth is, it's difficult. It means a lot of sacrifice. I mean, that little boy to give 1000 rupees on his birthday was a huge sacrifice. And I think to give anything, um, it's not that you give because you have enough and then you give, you give. Giving anything is a sacrifice. You have, a, you will feel the pinch somewhere. It will be tough. People will say, "What are you wasting your time?" People will give you their own funda. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a grouse. Everybody will has a piece of advice, especially in India. And uh, uh, yeah, it happens. But the point is, you keep the focus and you do what you can. And when you can do what you can in a in a in a, in a attitude of sincerity and, and well-meaningness and, and informed uh, passion, then people will join you, good people will come. We had a, 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 a gentleman bring a puppy to our center. She had gone on all the rounds of so many different veterinary hospitals and the treatment hadn't worked and she was dying and uh, the one doctor at the end told her, ah, take it to Blue Cross if you die there. And they brought it to Blue Cross in we, of Hyderabad and uh, we nursed it back to health and we were so sad the kind of treatment that was rushing, 16 injections in one day. Anyway, we nursed her back to health and we were happy to see her go back home. That gentleman donated us a crore of rupees. Your work will your work will stand for what you are and people will come forward to help. So ma'am? Yes. I would like I would like to ask uh, you had mentioned in your talk that uh monkey problem
Sri Lanka campus. So we are, we are helpless and restless for a few years finding out the solution. Could you please help us? Nicely put. Um, did you know that um, this campus was a national forest? When the German collaboration started to build IIT and all of that, I really wish they had also initiated a program to rehabilitate all the animals that were being displaced. And because that didn't happen, it's been what, 1947 to now? 47 it was declared a forest, national forest? Yeah, I'm told for 1947 was this place was a national forest. So now, um, what I suggest is to call for a meeting with the wildlife department and for the monkey experts, which would be um, the only ones I know of are in the Himanshal government. Himanshal Pradesh government has a monkey expert team working with their monkey issues. And Mr. John Hicks, who lives in Goa, he's also a monkey expert climate expert and um, you need to sit down and work out what would be best. Um, I'm thinking an orientation to how to how to uh, interact with animals. So there's certain do's and don'ts. There's certain do's and don'ts. You know, we go to schools with a very nice education program. Uh, because most kids are afraid of animals, they are afraid and a lot of the poorest schools the kids have had some bad experience and we say, so have you ever been, who, who, who's afraid of dogs and 50% of the class will put their hands up. So we say, okay, come up and please tell us what happened and the kid says, uh, uh, this dog came near me so I kicked it and I ran away. <laughs> And then he ran after me and he bit me. <laughs> so we go on to explain what does, when the dog comes near you, what is he doing? And what should you do, what should you do? Never run around a dog. A dog loves to chase. He doesn't have a hand. He's going to catch you with his... And then you'll say, he bit you. So jokes apart, um, it's it's very critical that we as a species know what another species is saying or doing and you know their behavior patterns. So have a monkey expert come and talk to you about do's and don'ts around primates. Never ever ever feed them. Feeding them is an invitation to come stay with you. And they're wild creatures, right? We don't want them around. So, yeah, I would say that's, that's the only way to do it. It's not something that would come in a one-liner or a two-liner from me. You'll have to see what, to what extent, you'll have to do a survey of how many monkeys, where do they frequent, what's the garbage disposal, because they're, they've adapted, because their forest is gone, they've adapted to scrounge on human garbage. See, we're also, there's so much like us, you know? so much like us and um, they learn to adapt to live around us so you'll have to look at all of that garbage disposal, behavior patterns, where are the fruiting trees, um, what are the solutions you can do, is there a sterilization program to prevent them from growing in numbers and stuff like that. Yeah, I can share with you the, the addresses to reach out. Yes. One last question. Yeah. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, before coming here, I saw a documentary called Earthlings. Yes. Yeah. Who's that? Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, firstly, I request everyone to see the documentary. It's very good. Uh, secondly, I want to ask you, how hard was it to 
be uh, to go to being a vegan from being a vegetarian because that's more difficult. And uh, I personally want to become a vegan, so it's very difficult to become a vegan because you should not consume milk and things like that. So how, what, what advice would you give to me? I'm so glad you brought up this. Earthlings is um, Earthlings is a very earth-shattering film. You know, you have to brace yourself and be very brave to watch it. But if you care even one iota about other species that live on this earth, as this young man says, please watch it. Please watch it. It is an eye opener. Having said that, uh, my transition from vegetarian to vegan happened about five years ago. Uh, five years ago, as a part of the Animal Welfare Board, I would uh, I was asked to go inspect government slaughterhouses, and in the slaughterhouses, all I saw were dairy buffaloes, and each one of them young enormous ones, the others were still full of milk. You could see that their, their calves must have just been snatched from them. And the look on their eyes was like, I shouldn't be here. I, I, I just, one look at those animals and I said, oh my god, I call myself an animal welfare activist, I'm working for animals, I don't want to eat them. And here am I, because of my addiction to milk, this creature is going through this cycle of suffering all because of me. Uh, that's a long story, but I went home and I just went cold turkey. And every time I had a, you know, any change, any dietary change, and I remember even when I became vegetarian from non-vegetarian, the first month is tough. The first month is difficult because your body is used to a certain nourishment and it craves. So the first month of cravings were there and it's annoying. Um, and you just have to calmly go through it and what helped me always was the image of that animal in my mind that look on her face where she's trying to tell me I shouldn't be here can you do something to help me I shouldn't be here my calf is there somewhere can you help me find my calf and that's the image I had in my mind and I held on to it for that one month and one month passed and the craving left completely I was over it and today I can walk past the works and I can only smell that buffalo. When you bring uh, something with dairy to me, I say, where's the cow? Where's the buffalo? I can smell her, you know? For me, the, the association is like that. But um, what helped me also was to attend a workshop called um, Teas versus Pills. It's run by a lady called Nandita Shah. And her organization is Sharan, www.sharan.org. You look, look up and see where her workshops are. It's a one day workshop and she starts with a beautiful breakfast spread of vegan food. Amazing food. And you eat that and you say, hey, I can do this. <laughs> and then you go through the morning of learning recipes and cooking for yourself and, and, and how to, what are the things in the market that are vegan. And then you have this lovely lunch with a great spread of vegan food and you say, oh, yummy, I want to do this. And then by the afternoon she goes through the cruelties as well and it just reestablishes the fact that yes, I'm going to do this. So, so that's how I do it. And I hope you can do it too. Good luck with that. Uh, excuse me, yes. one last question for me. Oh, one more, last question. Okay. Uh, there are uh, many people in the studio who are very deeply passionate of uh, choosing filmmaking, film making, film So okay. what is your uh, suggestion? Um, wonderful. Uh, I, um, I think films has a magic uh, that has connected every Indian heart. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic field. You make dreams come true. You create illusions. Um, I think the most disillusioning thing of a movie buff is to actually go see how the film was shot. Any of you seen Life of Pi? Yeah. You know there was no tiger, right? Yeah. The whole thing was done in a little set. Right? A little set was all digitally done. But, um, Coming to the filmmaking part of it, um, what do I say to young aspiring filmmakers? 
I would say go learn, go study it. That once you've finished here and you truly want to explore a filmmaking career, go do another degree in filmmaking. The courses are out there. Don't go rushing into it. Go do a training because it is a very professional field. And in that professional field, you will get a do uh, an entry in only if you have this, the, the tools. And the tools are being taught today. Uh, the institutes in India, my family, ourselves, we started Anapurna International School for Film and Media, which is a non-profit filmmaking school. We have from short courses to a four-year degree program. So look at the website. There's the Pune Film Institute. There's a... Um, uh, there are other, uh, our, our, our institute is tied up with Chapman University in the United States, which is one of the best filmmaking colleges in the United States. Um, there are film colleges everywhere. But do a course. Start with a short course so that you can find out whether you really, whether this is really what you're aspiring for. Or do you have it in you to, you know, to do this? And uh, because it's very different to what the final product is what the the, the audience see. The final product is not what the filmmaker sees. The filmmaker has to do all the two years of labor before that. As every good film has at least uh, three, two to three years of hard work that's gone into making it. Um, my older son uh, finished his degree and then did a short course and then got into films. My younger son is doing a long course, he's doing his uh, graduation in films. Um, they're all aspiring uh, to do films. I know there is a certain fascination to make good cinema. And it is uh, very exciting, there's a huge future. Although the industry, the big films, there are very few people who make those big films. And those teams are very tight, you know, they, you have to have the best, the best, the best, the best, and you come and may not get a break in there. But you've got the smaller films, um, you've got uh, television. Today, television is a much higher growth than films, than cinema. Um, you've got all the social media um, and internet and YouTube films which are growing on a 300% growth. So there are a lot of different avenues you can explore once you've got the skills and you know the skills to then showcase how good you are to the actual um, film producers. Because you've got to sell your idea to a filmmaker, right? Uh, a, a filmmaker needs a producer who will then raise the money to make the film. So you've got to sell your idea to that person that you are good at what you do and you have it in you to make that film. And marketing yourself is really about the, the, the professional world. So get your skills, learn to market yourself. Do enough small work that you can afford to do. Don't wait for the big break. And then you'll be able to convince somebody that you're going to make this fabulous film. And good luck with that. Appreciation, I'd like to call Professor Satyanarana to present the memento. brings us to the end of this extramural lecture. We hope, we hope to see you all for the next lecture which will be on Wednesday. Thank you.